Valentine's Day is here again, and couples looking for a movie to watch have thousands of romances at their disposal. A good old fright fest is exactly what the doctor ordered. There are plenty of scary flicks that can be enjoyed at any time of the year, but on the day of love, why not try a Valentine's Day horror movie? At 14 Valentine, more than a decade after rejecting a schoolmate, a group of women find themselves targeted by a killer who sends out disturbing Valentine's Day cards and loves to cosplay as Cupid. 21's Valentine feels ripped right out of the 80s, delivering no-frills thrills driven by blood and fake-outs. This film is not a terrible recreation of that era's style, however. Its Valentine's Day premise might conjure up visions of my bloody Valentine, and comparisons to that classic do the 2001 movie no favors. Still, Valentine is a serviceable slasher flick that has been mostly forgotten, so it might be worth throwing on if someone is looking for a film they have not seen yet. At 13 Hospital Massacre 1981, sometimes simplicity works in a movie's favor, and that definitely extends to Hospital Massacre. Also known as Be My Valentine or Else or X-Ray, Hospital Massacre delivers exactly what its title advertises, a lot of gruesome kills in a creepy setting. Taking place on Valentine's Day, Hospital Massacre lets its gore and environment do all the heavy lifting, limiting the story to an introductory flashback and a predictable final act reveal. This 1981 movie is purely for slasher fans, and it is a pretty decent entry in that subgenre of horror. Considering the early 80s were overflowing with stories about fictional killers and the people they stab, Hospital Massacre got a bit lost in the shuffle. At 12, Life After Beth 2014. Life After Beth 2014 is a wonderfully charming rom-com starring Aubrey Plaza and Dane DeHaan as they deal with the biggest challenge their relationship has seen yet, death. Critically, the film didn't receive fantastic reviews on release, but the A24 production brought in quite a few viewers who found a lot to love in this indie gem. For anyone looking for a fresh take on the zombie genre with a fun humorous twist, this might be the one. At 11, one of the most underappreciated films of 2018, Mandy sounds like the type of corny B-movie to fall immediately in the discount bin at the local grocery store, forever lost and forgotten to mediocre at best ratings. Mandy, however, is a pariah. Experimental director Panos Cosmato's second movie brings Nicolas Cage and Andrea Riseborough into one of the most visually and audibly striking films to ever hit the small screen. The movie plays out a revenge fantasy through a trippy modern take on classic sword and sandal fantasy epics. At 10, Picnic at Hanging Rock 1975, Picnic at Hanging Rock is an Australian classic about a group of girls who go missing during the eponymous event. The picnic happens to take place on Valentine's Day, which ties into the story's themes of sexual repression. Peter Weir's mesmerizing project creates a hazy atmosphere drenched in the unknown and specifically opts against presenting clear or understandable answers. While not horror by the conventional understanding of the genre, Picnic at Hanging Rock is deeply disconcerting and uncomfortable. The film gets under the viewer's skin, presenting with an unseen terror that has no face, purpose, motive, or reason for existing. At 9, Carrie 1976, Brian De Palma's Carrie is a wonderfully imagined classic and easily one of the best horror films of the 70s, regardless of its seemingly inconspicuous scale and subject. Carrie pulls a fast one on the genre, appearing on the outside to be a much more tame, universal story with a romantic outcome and a solid lineup of hot songs to really bump it into blockbuster territory. What lies in wait, however, is a much more troubled story of a girl so terribly abused that she unleashes something dark into the world when her final string is cut. At 8, Ready or Not 2019, a wonderful addition to the good for her cinematic universe, Ready or Not 2019 is a great little callback to the old days of horror for the fun of it. When a bride's wedding night goes a little too off the rails due to the groom's eccentric family, she has to take things into her own hands or else face an embarrassing fate that won't go without repercussions. Not only is the film a good representation of how it feels to meet the in-laws, but a wonderful light-hearted exercise in tension. At 7, Audition 1999, in one of Takashi Miike's best works, the ever-prolific director takes a romantic turn from his classically campy filmmaking. Audition looks into the world of industry exploitation and sexual misconduct, as a well-meaning director holds auditions to find himself a healthy relationship while recovering from the death of his wife several years ago. Not for the faint of heart, Audition creeps in with some of the most unsettling torture scenes in film history.
At six, Creep 2 2017 sequels, while they rarely get it right across any media, can often exceed expectations and become fan favorites in the franchise. Creep 2 from indie director Patrick Bryce is one of those sequels. Creep 2 side wins away from the first film in an interesting way, almost flipping the roles on their backs as the main antagonist of the original becomes a near romantic companion to Bryce's new protagonist. Viewers of the original should know exactly what happens next, but how it plays out through the film is extremely fun to watch and comes with a handful of fun surprises and genuinely heartfelt moments. At 5, Raising Kane 1992, Brian De Palma features again, this time with one of his less celebrated outings. Raising Kane is all over the place, and while that would be a criticism in most cases, it actually works in the movie's favor. Centering around a child psychologist and his various personalities, Raising Kane is bewilderingly excessive, unsettlingly imaginative, and visually gorgeous. A significant section of Raising Cain takes place on Valentine's Day, a decision that is about as baffling as the rest of the movie. Just to be clear, everything written about the movie in this entry is meant to be taken as praise. At 4, Ponapool 2008, a lesser-known zombie movie, Ponapool follows a radio DJ who has a rather tough start at his new job. On Valentine's Day, Grant receives a report that people are not only rioting, but also seem to have acquired a taste for human flesh. Stuck in a confined space with little room to maneuver, Grant and a few close associates must survive while trying to find a way to stop the spread of the infection. While not a particularly innovative take on the zombie genre, Ponapool understands this type of story's strengths well. Opting for a somewhat tongue-in-cheek tone, the Canadian movie throws out a few effective twists and even a couple of memorable scares. At 3, The Bride of Frankenstein 1935, another great sequel, James Whale's Bride of Frankenstein picks up directly after the reconned ending of the first film. Frankenstein finally gets what's been coming to him, as his creation takes his rightful revenge on the Mad Doctor. After the monster kidnaps his wife, Frankenstein is forced to create a bride to quell the loneliness of his original creation. Not everything goes as planned, however, and it soon becomes obvious that both parties got more than they signed up for. At 2, Possession 1981, one of the most surreal representations of Lovecraftian media, 1981's Possession from Polish director Andrzej Zalowski is not only a horrific descent into madness, but a disturbing look into love and heartbreak on par with Midsommar. The film follows a couple as they gradually fall deeper into depression over their imminent divorce and affairs. Through the duration, the slow burn atmosphere becomes more and more deranged as reality bleeds into fantasy, emotion blurs, and the terrifying heartbreak blends with an ever-growing eldritch evil. At one, My Bloody Valentine 1981, another genre classic, George Michalka and Steve Miller's My Bloody Valentine 1981 is one of the better slasher films of the older years. As a small mining town prepares for its annual Valentine's Day celebration, an ugly evil rears its head from a tragedy 20 years past. The sole survivor of a horrific mining accident seems to be back and wreaks havoc upon the youth who assumed him to be nothing more than an urban legend.